welcome to the July webinar. Um, my name is Harry Key. Uh, as you probably know, I work for CIC. I run our specialist services department. And today we're looking at relationships in the workplace. This is a really key topic at the moment, as far as I'm concerned. So many of us are thinking about or have already started this return to the office, being physically back around people again. Obviously, this will differ depending on what part of the world you're in. But we know over the next 12 months, there's going to be adjustments made to our relationships in the workplace. So this session, we're going to look at why relationships in the workplace can be important. We're going to look at how to foster them in a more uh, respectful way as we come back together, particularly after something so damaging and, and, and separative as, as the pandemic. Um, and then we'll also look at some of the kind of tools and techniques we can use to manage conflict and to yeah, just to have as healthy a relationship as possible when we come back. Like I said, I'm going to be asking for lots of your interaction throughout this. Talk to me in the chat, talk to each other in the chat, send me those private messages if you like. Um, there will be a couple of people that won't be able to hear. Um, I'm just going to send one message to respond to this and then I'll get on with that. We'll get on with it. Um, so. Because um, people who can't hear can't hear me explaining that they'll have to rejoin um, when I say it on voice. Um, so relationships in the workplace, what's happened? Well, prior to the pandemic, um, and this was true for me personally, I was spending more time with people at work. I didn't particularly choose to spend more time with these people than I would have done. But here I was at work with these relationships where I was spending more time with those people than I was with some of my family, friends and loved ones. Um, I don't know about any of you guys. Let me know in the chat if you agree. Um, do some of you have relationships uh, in your personal life that you've spent less time on than relationships in the workplace? And look, these relationships in the workplace aren't just professional work relationships. They can be personal ones too. We can have very close, very welcoming friendships in the workplace. A couple of people here are, are, are agreeing. And, and, and I think that the personally important side of it is really key as well. Because sometimes, and we'll look at this when we look at workplace culture, sometimes workplaces know that we really thrive on these close relationships, but then also feel a bit threatened by close personal relationships happening in the workplace. I'm not here talking about romantic relationships. I'm talking about close personal friendships within the workplace. It can be so powerful for people's career. People can give that vital peer support that I talk about a lot. They can do a lot of that kind of Cons uh, consultation with each other, helping each other with their career. Um, it's really powerful to have someone that you count as a close friend in the workplace sometimes. Um, and maintaining these relationships, working on them, some of the social stuff we do, along with the professional stuff we do, has a positive effect on our mental well-being and generally our morale within the workplace. There's a really good survey by Hiscox that said 92% of people who responded to it thought that having friends at work improves their job satisfaction. And now job satisfaction might not always sound so important to everyone, but I know that if I'm more satisfied in what I'm doing, I'm also more productive. I also uh, suffer from less stress and I have less um, worries about the future because I feel part of a team, part of a community. So I'd love to hear your points of view and, and let me know by typing this out in the chat or you can put your hand up and I'll invite you to unmute yourself. Um, what do you miss doing with your colleagues? What do you miss spending time doing with them since we've been working from home or working in a bit more of a blended way for the last 18 months? And did some of those relationships, and I'd love to hear your examples in the chat. Um, remember, you can send them to me privately if you prefer. Did some of those relationships extend from the professional into the personal as well? I'd love to hear those kind of examples too. So uh, Vicky said chatting, just chatting socially, as simple as that. Yeah, it really can be that easy, right? Just having those social time to spend at work. Uh, I've said this a lot over the past you know, few months of the pandemic, but what I'm really missing is someone tapping me on the shoulder and saying, hey, it's time to go home. You know, we're turning the lights off or do you want to walk to the station together? Or do you want to go to the, to the pub together or something like that? Yeah. Catherine said going for a coffee break and a chat. Yeah, sometimes just getting some of those things out of our system can be really good at work. Um, someone said privately, I miss the common lunches and coffee sessions, chatting spontaneously in the corridor. Uh, going to the pub after work, Pete said, yeah, lunch break. Uh, someone's saying here, um, missing inconsequential chat, random things like a movie I've watched or something funny that they've read. 
yeah, that's really nice as well. Just having that opportunity to, you know, really be in touch with what's going on in people's personal lives can be useful. Um, chats over coffee, ad hoc conversations. It seems like a lot of people talking here about just generally chatting to someone, having someone around. I think that also speaks to the loneliness we can experience working from home. I am not in my home alone. There are other people working from this home, but I don't spend time with them during the day like I would do with my colleagues if I was in the office. Yeah, something about talking about what was on TV last night, chatting, laughing. Some person here saying, yes, I count many of my colleagues as personal friends. I've traveled with them, taking weekend trips as well. Yeah, some of us will go on holidays with our work colleagues. Some people will have work colleagues that are their friends coming to their weddings, birthdays, big events of their lives. Some are saying, I miss our chats and jokes, ad hoc conversations. Just seeing that number of people in a day, David Maynard said here, really important, yeah. Being exposed to humanity, being part of a community, part of a group is very important for human beings as animals. I really like that one. Off the cuff chat, sharing jokes in the office, being able to ask quick questions, someone said here. This is another one I'm missing. Being able to just turn around in my chair and ask someone else that I work with their opinion on some of my work or asking for their expertise when I know that they more, know more about it than I do. Sometimes leaping onto a video call just to disturb someone can feel so different. You know, if I'm in the office, I can turn around and see my colleague. I can see if they're available for me to have a quick chat with them. But when we're working remotely, I don't know what they're up to. I don't know what they're doing and how hard they're working or how busy they are, or how not in the mood for this they are. We miss all of that body language as well. Someone saying here, getting the gossip and hearing the news you don't hear through professional channels. Yeah, that's another good one. Discussing things not work related, says Beverly. Um, Beverly's found that over Teams or telephone calls, it only tends to be about work at the moment. There isn't so much of the personal. Yeah, I've noticed that as well. Um, and then they're saying some of us have been back in for a while now and the community of being in contact with those people again, even just bouncing thoughts of each other. So that sounds like it's been really positive for you. It's great. Uh, someone else agreeing with me here. Seeing people's body language is really important for building good working relationships. There are a lot of signals that we miss when we're working online. Yeah, absolutely. Feeling like a valuable member of, te of a team. Yes, yeah, so sometimes the relationships that we have at the workplace remind us that we're accepted, remind us that we're wanted. Human beings really, really rely on that trust. We rely on other people to let us know how we're getting on, absolutely. And then Caroline saying, our team never stopped working, but some of us got redeployed to different areas. And since we all got back, we've got people working from home, we can't lunch together. Sometimes you're like ships in the night. We feel disjointed and miss that whole team approach. That's a really good phrase that you've used there, I think, Caroline, a whole team approach. I haven't thought of it in that way before. I like that. Thank you for sharing it. So I saying football chats, comparing weekend matches. Yeah, having someone to talk about with a with a hobby in common. Sometimes that's how relationships, close relationships are formed at work. We find out we share a hobby in it. And it all goes from there. Thank you so much for sharing these, everyone. Um, I think they're really important. It's really important to remember what we've missed. So if you're one of those people listening that didn't write anything down or didn't think of anything, you were just listening to other pe pe people's point of view, think for yourself now, especially if you've been working home for a long time as I have. As I start going back to the office, which parts of the relationship do I really want to work on? What did I get the most out of? What is most important for me? Because your wants and needs in these relationships can be the most important thing and can be a really positive driver to restoring those relationships to where they once were. And finally, Ewan says here, working less as outputs have been unsustainable working remotely. I've heard so much of this, Ewan. I've heard so many people talking about how different their workload feels now that they're working remotely. So yeah, it's really key. So on to the next one. I wanted to talk about a healthy workplace culture. And I want to hear your examples as I talk about this. So keep typing things out in chat. What do you think your organization does or is doing to encourage and support good relationships in the workplace? I'd love to hear the ideas they've come up with because this is a really good space for us to share ideas. We've got what, just over 200 people here who will be from all different parts of the world, all different cultures, all different organizations. So sharing those can be vital. Um, so how we are allowed and encouraged to form these relationships depends on workplace culture. Workplace culture always starts at the top. 
always starts at the most senior people. That's usually what the managers below them follow and then the managers below them and then the staff below that. We follow by example. Um, and the Business Institute Norwegian's Business Schools research shows managers are significantly less stressed when they have solid, that's supposed to say, trusting relationships with employees. This is really vital. Any managers listening today, you can lessen your stress if you help your team generate these positive relationships. And I'll share some good tools and tips for that in a little bit. Uh, and the National Business Research Institute over in the US reported job satisfaction increases almost 50% when an employee develops close relationships at work. Positive and genuine relationships between employees are a key catalyst of positive employee culture, uh, company culture. And I couldn't agree more. There's a genuine nature. Someone said here, Mary Baldwin, you said uh, to the answer to my first question, what you're missing is authentic collection, that genuine relationship. Absolutely. Sometimes our relationships online can feel ingenuine. At the moment, when I've only got five minutes to check in with a member of staff or a colleague that I work with, I might ask them how they're doing, but we don't really have a huge amount of time for that. So it can feel a bit false or ingenuine. I think you're absolutely right. If ingenuine is a word, I'm not sure. Sometimes I make them up. Um, and then employees at highly trusted companies report less stress or burnout, more energy, higher productivity, fewer sick days and higher engagement. So we know that this is vital to our well-being at work. So, so people are saying um, the things here that their organization does to encourage and support these relationships. So we'll start with Stu. Uh, regular team meetings. Yeah. Oh, that's someone from my team. Hi, Stu. Yeah, re our regular team meetings can be a really nice way of continuing to check in with each other. Nice to see you, Stuart. Um, David says, people putting their cameras on. Yes, yeah, so for some people, being on camera all the time can feel really tiring and really exposing, and it can be a bit much. But we also know the positives of being able to have that visual interaction. We don't get all of the, uh, the kind of... Um, body language that we need, but we certainly get more visual cues to work from and it can be important. But then again, I'm at home. I might not feel like being on camera all the time. So this is a hard balance to come to. And look, you're going to hear this response from me a lot in all of these sessions. Talking about it is a good way to solve these problems. You can't force people to be on camera or force them to be off camera, but we know people lead by example. But it's much better if we can have an open conversation about the positives and negatives of both. Then people will feel more comfortable to do what suits them. Uh, someone else saying team meetings regularly. I feel that every company should have these as key part of their values or principles. So you're saying that companies should be explicit about valuing positive relationships. Yeah, I like that. Someone said privately virtual 11s with our group. I like that. Yeah, something that's just a bit social and, and also optional. There is nothing worse than forced online social events for work. Um, uh, the way I describe it is, you know, everyone getting in a room together for a party, but you can only listen to one person talk at the same time. That's not how we socialize. We socialize in small groups at the workplace much more effectively. So anything where we can have 11Zs or just even pairing people up for ad hoc conversations are great. Encouraging virtual coffees, uh, Monica's saying here. Yeah, that's that's really what I like. Having a retreat. I'm seeing more and more organizations that we work with coming to us, asking us to support and, and, and deliver presentations on company retreats they're doing at the moment. Having a specific block of time set aside for building these relationships as we come back. I like that. One-to-one -one water cooler sessions. Uh, Rachel saying, my team is small, but we're all really interested in each other and they have some great chats. My line manager makes space in meetings for chit chat and that's really valuable. Um, someone's saying, I'm thankful to my colleagues who are willing sounding boards, especially when I've encountered some challenges at work. Um, Catherine saying, it's also positive to work remotely, getting closer to colleagues in other countries. I agree wholeheartedly. I've reached out to colleagues from all places of the world that I wouldn't usually get to visit on my travels. So yeah, one needs, however, to be confident enough to exchange also on other topics than work. And it's that confidence here, Catherine, that this is why I'm talking about workplace culture. I am much more confident in doing something that I feel my organization supports me in doing, right? I, I would love to go and spend the rest of the afternoon in the park, but that's gonna take quite a lot of confidence for myself to just decide and go and do it. But if my boss sends a message to me saying, hey, it's beautiful weather, go and spend the rest of the afternoon working in the park if you can, that's gonna make me feel much more allowed to do it. So I really like what you're saying there, Katrin. 
Um, Gary says constant communication from CEOs. Yes, that communication from the top. Weekly video messages, messages monthly webinars and internal newsletters on change. Having these open conversations around change is a vital way for engaging in these relationships at the moment. I agree there, Gary. Thank you. Uh, virtual chats, managers being available and approachable. Again, as I said, we've lost that ability to just swing round in our chair and chat to someone quickly. We've lost that ability to walk past our manager's desk and have a quick look and see what kind of mood they're in and is now the time to have that difficult conversation or ask for a pay rise or take some leave or something. And, and yeah, we lost that ability. So having managers that open that door for us is much better. Caroline's saying we're in the NHS, uh, which here in the UK is the National Health Service for anyone abroad, and our trust set up a well-being team and we have well-being champions to support staff. It's great. There are online physical activities, crafts, Zoom, menopause cafes, sleep clinics, exercise classics. I'd say the trust is really trying to look after staff. That's beautiful. Uh, someone else saying standing solid as a senior team, we don't always agree, but we have positive and constructive conflict and respect each other. This is exactly the topic we're getting onto next, so I appreciate you starting us off on that one. One-to-one -one meetings. Yeah, having one-to-one -one check ins with your manager at the moment can be really key. Thank you so many for all of these examples. I'm not going to have time to read through them all. Um, Eleonora says, calling us back to the office starting a few days per week, keeping the office a safe space. Yes, so starting off slow, letting people feel in charge of how much they're back in the office. It almost sounds, um, it sounds almost unfamiliar at the beginning and there was a fear of infection, but if the situation is safe, you can just get the benefits of sharing time, space and chats with colleagues. Yeah, really good. Um, someone else saying senior team continue to have open house sessions for all on a regular basis. Beautiful. So it sounds like there are various ways that work in your different organizations. I think it's really good, first of all, to those of you that have had really positive experiences of this, make sure you're feeding back to your senior leaders how useful these sessions are, how important you're finding some of these uh, initiatives that they're putting in place. Because if they don't hear it, they don't know. So yes, organizational culture starts at the top, but it is maintained through constant feedback from the staff beneath. So keep that communication going as openly as you've spoken to me about it. I hope you feel comfortable speaking to your leaders as well. Ellen has said, what is involved in an open house session? Is it just having a time slot where they make themselves available? So first and foremost, yes, an open house session is just a time slot when you are as available as a leader or a manager or a line manager. This is really important for the very reasons I said earlier that I don't know when to approach my manager at the moment. I don't know whether they're working today sometimes. I don't know if they're in a good mood. I don't know if they're too busy. I don't know if there's concerns going on in the business that I'm not aware of, all of those kind of things. So just breaking down some of those barriers by a manager saying, by the way, I'll keep Thursday afternoons from 2 till 4 p.m. open. Anytime you've got a question, just drop 15 minutes in my diary. I really like that and allowing people to do it individually. Some organizations will do it as a group. Yeah. And then it says we are generally always available, but I can see the benefit of people knowing they can call at a specific time. That's it. It's just setting boundaries. The boundaries, we don't need so many of them when we're working in the office because we work them out human to human with body language and all these other cues. But not everyone works perfectly well remotely. Uh, some people were used to it because they did it by choice before the pandemic. Others felt a bit more forced into it. Guys, what a great discussion. Keep it going. I really enjoy these. Thank you. So when we're thinking about returning to relationships, this is really important. And I've got a little bit about having communication around this later on, but remove, resuming the same level of contact and closeness with people might feel scary. It might feel exciting. It might feel both. It might make us not want to leave our house. It might make us run out ready to go way before we're allowed back in the office. We all have different adjustments for this. It's been an extended time apart for so many of us. So pace yourself. Do not expect relationships to snap back immediately to where they were. Don't get frustrated if they do. Just share what's going on. Make time to listen and hear other people's concerns. I might be perfectly ready to resume my friendly relationship with you. You're not the problem, but I'm fearful because of my experiences through the pandemic. I'm fearful because of what I've been doing since I've been working from home. We have all had different experiences in the pandemic. I, I, I can't stress this enough. 
so often I'm coming across people, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, doing these comparisons, comparing my experience to someone else. It's impossible. We were all thrown into a situation where we were working within our home lives. All of our home lives are different, so all of our working lives became different. So we just need to give space for listening so that we can build trust and understand what they want and need out of the relationship. And we also need to start to learn to communicate our needs a bit more explicitly. Because we haven't been able to rely on that constant close contact, we need to be a bit more explicit about how we feel about relationships. Um, you and said here, great opportunity to reset challenging relationships. Absolutely. Yes, some of those relationships that we didn't feel comfortable around before the pandemic. This is a great reset. This can be a way of, of, of resuming it in a more positive way. Good way of thinking you and very positive. I like it. And Angela says here, our team met in the park. You know, we don't have to wait and meet at the office when the office is ready to have us. We can have social events outdoors in a safe, socially distanced way that might be more suitable. Cool, thank you guys. Keep the questions and comments coming. I wanted to bring up this, this kind of table of conflict. So um, our, our parent company, APM in Australia, came up with this um, idea in one of their recent help sheets. And I really liked it, so I've stolen it from them. Um, so managing conflict. This is how I speak about conflict normally. Conflict greatly increases stress on your team and your organization, yet it will be a natural part of the work we do, especially as we're returning, especially as we're committing more change to our workplaces. So have a look at this table here. Once we're in a relationship and things are being dealt with through actions in the amber zone or the red zone, we're in stress. We're in a stressful, difficult situation. If we're in the green zone, we're in a situation where stress is far less likely and constructive criticism and constructive conflict can be had. I can't remember who it was who said it a minute ago, um, but yeah, someone was talking about this managing conflict. I'd love to hear in the chat your examples of managing this conflict as people start to return to the office. I'd love to hear positive examples where you think it's been managed well. I'd also like to hear negative examples. Remember, you can send them to me privately if you don't want your name attached to it. If you send it to me privately, I'll respond privately. Emily said, I like this and would like to share with my managers or supervisors. So if you're signed up to our um, our kind of newsletter, um, you'll get a link to the recording after this session and a list of the slides. Um, if you go to uh, the website that I'm about to put into the chat, you'll find the link at the bottom of the page to sign up to the newsletter if you haven't done it already. Uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, it's CICWellbeing.com, nice and simple. So we want to stay out of this amber zone and the red zone. Because what that's pushing us towards is, is, is useless conflict, basically. It's conflict that puts me in a defensive or an aggressive mode. Not one where I'm accepting the conflict and moving on from it, but one where I'm trying to defend my position, where I'm polarizing people into two sides. Um, and yeah, and if that goes on too far, especially where there's power dynamics involved, we can end up in the red zone. So in the green zone, we're looking at dealing with things with civility. And this is a real um, kind of challenge to managers sometimes. You know, managers are used to solving problems. That's often why you end up in a management position. You're good at problem solving. Conflict isn't a problem to solve and stop, because if you stop it and don't allow the conflict, the pressure rises and we're much more likely to come back together in those amber or red zones. So what we need to do instead of trying to solve the problem is allow the conflict but make sure that it continues in a civil and respectful way. So one thing I talk to managers about, and I'm sure there's a few of you listening, one thing I talk to managers about in all sessions that I do with groups of managers is just stepping in when you overhear a conversation that broaches that civility or respect that we're, that we're trying to get in the workplace, not to stop the conversation, but just to say, I just want to interrupt. I think that this conversation should continue, but I just want to remind you to speak to each other with the respect we deserve. Just that little reminder is all a manager needs to do. We don't need you to be a superhero and tear us apart and do an investigation on one side, then do an investigation on the other side. If it's the initial start of a bit of conflict of a professional or even a personal disagreement, allow people to have the conversation, but make sure it's done in a civil way. Heck, you don't need to be a manager to do this. Any colleague can jump in on any relationship and uh, any conversation and remind people to act, act with civility and respect. Um, 
someone said here in the chat encouraging people to manage their own conflicts early and directly not dragging others in yes we have a conflict framework for reference and guidance yeah conflict frameworks can really help and that's why i like this because this can often form the start of that as well yeah julie says a conflict framework sounds like an interesting idea because a conflict framework is basically a nice set of rules when i notice that i'm in conflict with someone i'm then empowered and i have the resources to be able to say this feels like a bit of conflict how do you feel about following the conflict framework? And then me and the member of staff, me and the colleague can go through this framework. It sounds like a bit of extra work, but it's worth it. Working on relationships is always worth it. It's not, again, not gonna come as a surprise speaking to a psychotherapist, but I think that being explicit and working on these relationships can get much more about it. Someone said something interesting to me here privately, and I'll read it out to you all. We need to rebuild relationships which were damaged by miscompute, gosh, I will read it out once I get my words. We need to rebuild relationships which were damaged by miscommunication, which happened due to working from home or absence of being able to check in on each other. The conflict went unnoticed for so long and escalated due to not having these informal ways of checking in on each other. I feel like we need a reset and healing. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that comment. Uh, that's why I thought I'd read it out to you all. Um, I like it because yes, conflict will have increased during the pandemic. If I can't see the human being next to me, I'm much more likely to deal with it from my point of view rather than sharing points of view with them. So make sure that you're making space for these conflicts to be resolved. And yes, if we ignore it or if we don't see the conflict because we're working remotely, it can embed and get deeper. Someone said here, uh, Haitha said in the chat, yet yeah, sometimes support is needed if you don't feel safe tackling the conflict with the person on the end of it, other end of it. Absolutely. I once told my manager I needed support. What they did was tell my colleague everything I said to them and then tell the colleague to speak to me. That was not helpful at all. And that's what I mean by a manager trying to solve a problem that they have no place solving. The problem is between these two people. It needs to be solved between these two people. But sometimes, particularly with difficult power dynamics involved, I might not feel comfortable going on my own to address this conflict with the person. This is why I, I, most conflict uh, frameworks will, will will allow for this. This is why I should be able to go and speak about that conflict confidentially in the first instance with someone and get some guidance on how to deal with that without someone going behind my back and sharing that information with my manager, with anyone else involved in the conflict or, or with anyone else at all. If there's no risk involved to my health and safety or the health and safety of someone else, there is no good reason for that, that confidentiality to be broached. So I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. Thank you, Heiser. Uh, someone said here positively an evidence-based discussion will reduce conflict and someone else saying privately what about conflict arising from opposing views that are so emotive such for example the vaccine and views on the pandemic this is a really interesting one i'd love to hear your examples of this i am not so experienced of this this is this is conflict that's new in the workplace for many of us also i thought when i started researching this actually this is the kind of conflict that's been around in workplaces for a long time. It happens around big elections when places are very polarized between one party or another. It happened around Brexit here in the UK. You know, people working alongside people where organizations were 50-50 split. The difficulty and the difference with the pandemic is this is about our individual health and safety and how comfortable we feel. So it brings the personal and the professional crashing together in a way that we haven't seen before. My guidance and my recommendations is to make space for people to air their concerns. And we'll do a little bit of that here. But within your organization, there should be a place where you your concerns about being back in the office can be heard. Absolutely. As someone saying, uh, Julie saying, do you have examples of a link to a conflict framework, please, Harry? Yeah, I'll try and share one in the email that goes out. Um, but if not, I, I, I really rely on a lot of the stuff that's um, written on. The, there's a website called safeguardingmatters.co.uk that I use a lot. It talks mainly about safeguarding, but it's also got some good pages on conflict. Um, and ACAS here in the UK, ACAS is a great service for talking about um, managing conflict. The ACAS website can be accessed for wherever you are in the globe and their guidance on managing conflict there will be really useful. I believe they have a page on conflict frameworks, but um, don't quote me on that. Um, 
I, uh, sorry, I got your name wrong there, sorry. Uh, Alida says, following a curious, not critical approach to gain understanding before jumping to conclusions. Yes, that's a great way of dealing with difference of views and difference of ideologies. Yeah, be curious about that person's ideology instead of immediately saying, well, I think the opposite, because then you, it's much harder to find that compromise. Yes, positive and evidence-based. Um, someone saying, does it? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, Someone says here, the high risk I have experienced is being misunderstood on the support I need or expect. So very important to seek clarification before assuming the support being requested. Yeah, this is one thing I talk to managers a lot about. A key phrase I like to give to any of the managers listening is not your job and it's not your responsibility to solve all these issues, but you should be able to check in with staff if they feel supported. So one of my favorite lines for managers to use at the moment is just to ask your members of staff, do you feel you're getting all the support you need at the moment? If they say yes, you say fantastic. Do you mind if I check in in a month's time? If they say no, I'm not getting all the support I need at the moment, then you can say, well, let's look at all of the different options that you have for support here at whatever your company is and go through it with them. It doesn't have to be you that gives all that support. In fact, it's often not appropriate for you as a manager to give all that support. Make sure you're leaning on the resources that are available to you and your team. Uh, someone says here, Caroline, uh, I've got a close friend who thinks that COVID is a conspiracy and is anti-vaccinations. My opinions are the polar opposite. I value his friendship, so we politely agree to disagree. It's not worth breaking a friendship over. It's a really positive way of speaking about it, absolutely. Mary says, for emotive conflict, I've found that the important part is making people feel heard and listened to. We may not agree, but having that space for difference is okay. We cannot solve conflict by both sitting in our trenches. Absolutely right. All we get is war. We've seen it endless times over human life and, 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 and the rest of humanity. Religions have done this for centuries, fighting rather than listening. Um, yeah. Someone said here, though, uh, privately, I have lost a friend of over 30 years who thinks I'm mad for having the vaccine and I disagreed with their view as I feel that they are being selfish. Yet. Yeah. Not yet come across this in the workplace, though. The issue of care workers having the vaccines is interesting and how that might play out in the workplace and HR issues. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I'm sorry to hear about that friendship. Perhaps when the time comes, there might be an opportunity for this 30 year friendship to repair. You do not have to lose a, a relationship forever. Uh, someone here saying I've been super, super cautious um with regards to safety measures during the pandemic and i felt nothing but respect and maybe a bit of bafflement for all that at work we were arranging to meet in person and it was made clear that everyone was happy to wait if someone wasn't comfortable with the idea and no one asks if there's a reason for wanting to be so cautious really accepting has helped me to push myself to meet up with them exactly to the people that are more comfortable you're much more likely to get a positive response if you're accepting of someone feeling uncomfortable than if you don't dismiss their point of view. Uh, someone else said, here says, Rally International Nepal has conflict of interest policy of the organization and properly orientated to all staff. So you could talk about this more openly when you've got that framework. That sounds really good. Um, got so many great comments coming in. Uh, Hi for saying, as a person who's clinically extremely vulnerable to COVID-19, this period has been so charged with anxiety. We talked about this a little bit in our last session. I found that people have been very understanding, but I'm worried about when we're told to go back. I'm very open with my condition and people usually respond very well to that matter of fact attitude. I think that matter of fact attitude might help, but not everyone will feel comfortable with that. So this can be difficult. Remember, speak to your manager about this, if, especially if you're talking about personal health concerns. You can always check in with the confidentiality first if you're not sure. The best way to start a confidential conversation with someone is to check the confidentiality. When confidentiality is assumed, that's when it can go wrong. But if I'm about to start a conversation with my manager and say, I'd like it to be confidential, check with that first. Just say, look, I want to talk a little bit about some personal health issues and how I'm not sure about coming back to the office. Can I rely on confidentiality for that before we have this conversation? And Ellen has added here in the chat something useful. And if managers can't help, you can contact your HR team who will be able to help, especially with medical issues. Yeah, HR should be able to help. And remember, always check on confidentiality. It's just a nice thing to be able to do for both sides of a conversation. It helps everyone relax a little bit if they know what the rules are before we start talking. 
So I mentioned respect and civility, so I thought I'd define it. I was searching and searching around for a COVID related image on respect and civility. And I thought of our transport workers here in the UK. So many of us here in, in, in the UK in big cities are concerned about the return to the office because of our commute, because of being on public transport again. But how many people think of the, cons of, of the people working on those public transport lines? Do we think carefully about their well-being and the respect and civility they deserve? Because across all my years, no matter what the issue is with the world, I feel like transport workers get, get taken out on them more than anyone else. Bus drivers getting shouted at, tube drivers getting you know, physical and verbal abuse all the time. Um, so I, I, I chose this picture of this person lovingly cleaning a tube train that probably happens a couple of times a day at the moment. We must treat everyone with respect and civility, particularly if we know the only thing that they're trying to do is keep people safe. It might be a pain, it might get in the way of our day, but if it's what they've been asked to do in order to ensure our health and safety, I think we need to do it with respect and civility. Um, so keeping relationships respectful and civil should always be the goal. Usually we succeed. How many of you here, 213 of you here, this feels respectful and civil. We're not trying particularly hard to do that. That's just naturally how human beings relate to each other. The thing is, no workplace is conflict free because two people will never agree on everything, no matter how positive a relationship is. But honest, trusted relationships, and someone said this in the chat earlier, thrive on healthy conflict. That's how we make good, informed decisions. As long as we're staying in that green zone, as long as we're staying in this zone where we're dealing with these kind of things, civility, respectful disagreement, healthy conflict, where we've got positive, supportive relationships around us during the conflict, and we're having open and robust conversations. We're staying away from disrespect, personal attacks, bullying, harassment, taking sides, being polarized. We're trying to hear from each other. So we, we keep ourselves in the green by managing conflict and disagreements in this civil and respectful manner. We reach res resolutions and decisions regardless. We don't just leave things split. If people aren't decided, we find a middle ground and say this is what we're going to work towards. And managing these situations well does involve good organisational culture, as we've talked about, but it also involves individual skill. Some of us will be better at this than others. Some of us will be more practised in it. Some of us will be better listeners than others. And I might be a really good listener on one topic, but a terrible listener on another because I'm so personally involved in it. Human beings are inconsistent and we have to be allowed to be. So can we invest a little bit in changing organizational culture? And we've talked a bit about how you can do that by reporting upwards the, the good things that you see and by the senior people leading by good example but also individual skill, perhaps investing in both with some conflict management training as well can be really helpful with this kind of thing. Yeah, Rachel said uh, here, even if two people disagree, approaching the conversation with curiosity can help both parties to feel respected and listened to. I like that idea of curiosity. There's, there's, a, there's an existential psychotherapist that, that I really like called uh, Ernesto Spinelli, and he talks about unknowing. He talks about going things in a way of unknowing, of, you know, not not assuming that I know everything about something, letting someone teach me about their world. Um, Marion says, it's good to hear you say this. I have family working on transport and a friendly face or voice in a respectful manner makes their day. Of course it does. It makes my day, it makes your day, it will make their day as well. Absolutely. Um, oh, I'm glad that, well, send them my love. I think it's probably a hard place to be working at the moment on public transport. Uh, Eleanor says being a good listener is a very important skill, active listening being a key point, actively listening to what is being said, being responsive and acknowledging what's being said. Absolutely. People are much more likely to double down on their emotions if they don't feel their emotions are accepted. I.e., If I'm angry at you and you're not acknowledging my anger, I'm just going to get double angry so that you really hear my anger. You know? Again, this happens all the time in public spaces. And look, what I'm talking about here is respect, so I feel like it's worth defining. There are two definitions on this screen of respect. The first one, I do not have for all my colleagues. I will not have a deep admiration for someone elicited by their abilities, quantities and achieve qualities and achievements. I don't have that for everyone. But what I should have is this second one, 
due regard for their feelings, wishes and rights. If I start with that as respect as a minimum, I'm in a better place than some people are uh, starting out. Someone said here privately, uh, how to approach a colleague who thinks any conversation around relations between colleagues is something that becomes a personal and not a professional conversation. And this position does not allow to check on possible conflicts. I think just looking up about kind of guidance and rules around conflict management. When you're talking about conflict in the workplace, you're talking about personal relationships in the workplace. Conflict isn't professional. Uh, if it's healthy, it is, but if it's gone into those amber or red zones, it's not professional. It's become personal. It's become tribal. It goes back to our old animal instincts. Remember, I said defensive or aggressive. So if you can show them, I think, some of the science behind conflict management, I think that can really help. Like I said, you know, there are plenty of organizations, CIC included, who offer conflict management training out there that might be useful. The next thing is we're all good listeners. We're all fantastic at changing the organizational culture. What about our needs? What about our concerns? This is the hardest part for many, particularly those that are very concerned and think about others' needs, often forget about how to attend to their own needs. And I'd love to hear your experience of this. Um, I I'm talking here mainly around our concerns around the pandemic. This is gonna be the polarizing and decisive issue that leads to a lot of conflict within the workplace. You know, I, I was talking to, to one leader the other day who was talking about how they're allowed to set rules for their staff, but they're not allowed to set rules for their members of this workplace. So they have members that can come and do one thing, but their staff have to follow a very different set of rules. And that's OK when it's talking about conduct and things like that. They are separate groups of people. So they have separate rules. But when it's about health and safety, and the example I gave them as, as an analogy, and some of you might find this useful. If there was construction going on in the workplace and the health and safety advice was to wear a hard hat, everyone would have to wear one before they came in. If there's a pandemic in the workplace and the health and safety advice is to wear a mask, why should some people not have to wear one and some people do? I think this is what creates the really decisive issue is leaving it up to people's choice. And I think particularly here in the UK, that's going to cause a difficult couple of weeks. Uh, someone said, hey, Julie, do you have any advice about when one department just doesn't respect the needs of another? Yes, get the senior leaders involved. This is their job. Senior leaders, senior management, CEOs, directors, it is their job to manage conflict between teams because if they can effectively manage that conflict, then they can have a more productive organization. And Julie's then responded to say, try that, no change. I, I would try grassroots things then. I, I would try speaking to the, to the colleagues of a similar level of you in the other team, if you have any civil relationships there and say, hey, look, we're not gonna, we're not gonna solve the, you know, the biggest mathematical problems of the world, but what can we do to sort out this relationship between our two teams? Uh, Haifa says, I love how you're being optimistic about it being a couple of weeks. Yes, sorry, I meant the, the height of the difficulty will be the next couple of weeks here in the UK because we just changed our rules here on Monday, so a couple of days ago. Julie says, tried it for 20 years, no change. I think it's, if, if a conflict is 20 years embedded, expecting one person to be able to change it is really tough, um, and I don't envy your position. But I, I would I would say spend as much energy on it as you're willing to spend, but make sure that you're spending enough energy taking care of yourself so that you're not being affected or hurt by this conflict every day. Caroline said here, I treated a patient yesterday who took his mask off once seated. I asked him politely to put his back on, to which he replied, we don't have to wear masks. I replied that in the hospital, patients and staff have to continue wearing masks and he begrudgingly replaced it. I can see this being an issue, to be honest. Yeah, it can be. So this is the kind of thing that I talk about. I want to have a conversation with someone. I need to have a conversation with someone because it's about my needs. Usually there's a response I'm looking for and a response I fear, right? So let's take your example there, Caroline, of talking to the patient. The response that you were looking for was someone saying, oh gosh, sorry, I'll put the mask back on. I'm very polite, very respectful. The response we fear is someone outright refusing and saying, well, I know my rights or you know whatever it might be. The reality is usually something in the middle. 
The reality is usually something that's respectful, but maybe begrudgingly or disrespectful, but maybe just on the border and acceptable. Yeah. So I, I think it's just really nice if we just remember it's probably not going to be the response that I'm looking for exactly, but it's probably not going to be the response I fear the most. It's likely to be somewhere in the middle. That sometimes helps me deal with the anxiety of bringing up these difficult conversations. I just said, got it. It was just funny. I'm trying very hard also to be optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. Two weeks, probably still a bit optimistic. You're right. Mary says, sometimes just acceptance, Julie, recognizing you have tried from all angles and accept that it is key. Can you get supervision or support from someone else? Yeah. Who can recognize that you've tried really good advice. Thank you, Mary. So I've shared this slide in a couple of my presentations, but I wanted to highlight here some of the traps we might be falling into around coming back to these relationships. First and foremost, worrying about things we can't control. We cannot control the organizational culture of our organization on our own. We cannot control what other people are going to do, but we can communicate with them to help them. Unhealthy comparisons is a huge trap to fall into at the moment. Remember, I said this earlier, we're all very individual by our very nature. So comparing our experience to someone else's can actually be really detrimental sometimes. Withdrawing from this social contact. We know as human beings, when we're not doing well mentally or emotionally or physically, we like to withdraw so that we can go and get better. We're, we're trained to do this from our animal brain, really. It comes from our ideas around sickness, right? If I'm sick, I'm supposed to go over here to get better so I don't infect everyone else. I mean, it's exactly the kind of thing the pandemic is talking about. We are taught this in our animal brain about sickness. So these comparisons are natural, and so is this withdrawing for social contact, but just watch out for it. And then burnout from a lack of boundaries. Many of us have become very unboundaried in our work since we've started working more remotely, particularly those of us that didn't choose to and don't have it as a natural skill. Yes, working from home is a skill. So if we don't have it naturally, we might have dropped our boundaries. We might be working longer hours. We might have taken on extra responsibility that we don't have the capacity for. Coming back is a good time to reset that and think about having good boundaries. So the last couple of things I'm going to talk about are my very standard well-being tips that some of you will be bored by by now, but I'm not going to stop talking about them. I, I picked a couple of two, uh, a couple here that I think are very related to this. First of all, take your break. Think about a restful activity that suits you most. Make sure you're keeping something constant through all this change. So find a rest that lets you relax from the worries of the pandemic, relax from the pro problems of home and work and just come back to yourself. Because this way, if you're taking a break that really suits good rest for you, first of all, you'll be improving your mental health, but also you'll be finding time to check in with your needs, which is very vital. Rachel said here regarding boundaries, it can be difficult letting colleagues into your home and that can feel quite invasive. Yes, yeah, so setting really good boundaries. What can you all see of my home? Uh, a very specifically curated corner of it that I've decided to let people into. Absolutely. I won't show you the, the, the ton of other stuff that's very personal to me over there. Yeah, I might think quite carefully about this. Good point, Rachel. Next one is to think about kindness and compassion. And I, again, I love this quote, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. The better I am, the more useful I am. Kindness to others is easy for us as human beings. We're designed for it. It gives us serotonin and endorphins and it feels great. Kindness to ourself is much more difficult. So as well as thinking about building your relationships with other people as we return, think carefully about building your relationship with yourself, listening to yourself, being honest with yourself and finding out what your needs are and then treating yourself with some kindness. This is an absolute antidote to fear and anxiety as it puts us back in charge. And then once again, I'm going to share my favorite sleep tips from Dr. Ramakan's book, Tired But Wired. I know I am more cranky when I haven't had a good night's sleep. I know I'm not going to get on with you as well when I have not had a good night's sleep. So I do need to be looking after this to help me with conflict. Conflict is managed much more easily after a good night's sleep. Um, many personal relationships will tell you that. Yeah, Try not to go to bed angry, but if you have to, try and deal with it first thing in the morning after a good night's sleep. Rachel says, yeah, I have super short hair. I end up losing part of my head, but the backgrounds are a great idea. Yes, yeah, so those backgrounds can, can help block things out a little bit unless you've got really short hair. Good point. I didn't think of that. 
Um, so I'll leave these up on the screen for a minute, but look, um, I'll send around a copy of the slides with the recording as well, so you we all can see it. Those of you on YouTube have the uh, benefit of being able to pause me and shut me up for a minute so that you can watch. So uh, don't forget, those of you that are members of CIC can come and speak to us at any time, 24 hours a day about any situation you're dealing with. You can get confidential guidance and support. Go and have a look at wellonline.co.uk. Um, you'll all have different logins for this. Each organisation has a different login. So speak to your HR team if you don't know it. Um, and, and anyway, you can always uh, call us or, or email us at assist, by the way, at assist at CICwellbeing.com to get in touch if you have any questions. So that's plenty of time for a few questions and answers. Um, I'm going to get rid of my slides because we don't need this one here. Um, and hopefully you found that session useful, enjoyable. Uh, to those of you that are watching on YouTube, I'm going to end the recording now. Uh, hopefully you found this useful. Feel free to check out the other recordings here. Um, each of our monthly webinars gets put up just after I've done them. It usually takes a day or two. Thank you very much and goodbye. And to those of